Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARTP. My name is Shireen Derakshani, and I will be hosting today's session on what do various non-commercial actors in the antibiotic research and development ecosystem do. Revive is GARTP's education and outreach program. It aims to connect and support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge, and connecting people. These webinars are part of our educational activities. All our webinars are recorded and are freely available to view after the live broadcast on our website. As well as the webinar recordings, you can also read our series of articles known as Antimicrobial Viewpoints, where experts discuss various topics within the field. We also have a resources section that includes the antimicrobial encyclopedia. There you can find definitions on various important topics within the field. And also some of these terms include videos that are explained by experts further. As always, our presentation today is followed by a question and answer session. So on this slide, you can see how to use the panel from your GoToWebinar platform. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar um, via the question panel, and we will try to address as many questions as we can during the Q&A session. I'm very pleased to welcome today's speakers. We have Laura Marin, Peter Bayer, Erin Duffy, and our moderator, Helman Gutens. Helman is Emeritus Professor of Medical Microbiology at the University of Antwerp, Belgium, and Chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee of GARTP. His translational research, Helman seeks to enhance the standard of health care, public health, and professional standards. His vision is to build a sustainable infrastructure for clinical research on infectious diseases in Europe. Hellman's coordination of a great number of international research projects has been fundamental in the fight against antimicrobial resistance and pandemic infectious diseases. Welcome, Hellman. I now hand over to you to introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Shireen, and uh, welcome uh, everybody, wherever you are in the world. It's a, a really great pleasure um, uh, to moderate this uh, webinar, and it's also a great honor um, uh, to have the opportunity to introduce to you three fantastic non-commercial uh, organizations in our fight against anti antibiotic resistance. And so the first organization um, will be presented by Laura, uh, Laura Marin. Uh, Laura is basically the head of the Joint Programming Initiative on Antimicrobial Resistance. Um, that is actually hosted by the uh, uh, Swedish uh, Research uh, Council. And uh, she has also a very important task on uh, the preparations of the future One Health EMR uh, partnership. I have to say that I have been, I've had the opportunity to uh, collaborate with Laura over the last maybe 15 years or so, and it's been always a great pleasure working with her, and I'm really looking forward to her presentation. Laura, you have the floor. Thank you, Herman. It's been a pleasure working with you for many years. Herman was the very first chair of our scientific committee, really in shaping these global research priorities on IMR, and look where we are today, you know, uh, working together with WHO and Quadripartite in developing a global IMR research agenda. So Herman always been there for the IMR community on how we can tackle this issue. And I'm going to be here talking today about what GPIMR, the Joint Preventative on Antimicrobial Resistance, is doing in the uh, landscape of uh, contributing to feeding uh, the antimicrobial pipeline. So it's a pleasure to be being here today with all of you and with the colleagues from GARP and, and CARBEX and, and, and to showcase a bit more our um, collaborations. So, at the, trying to hear, well, sorry, I'm just struggling with the, 
uh, here. Here we are. Sorry for that. So in the last about seven years, uh, GPMR has been supporting IMR research globally. GPMR is an intergovernmental organization who gathers about 30 countries worldwide to really mobilize a research funded together to support IMR in a One Health approach. So in the last years, we've been supporting about 170 projects um, in, uh, with researchers located in 80, more than 80 countries around the world. So it's really try to have a global outreach in the research communities that we are supporting. And so we are not only supporting direct research, competitive research in the IMR field, but also we are supporting capacity building and networking activities and trying to create large networks of researchers in the world and try to increase the community, the scientific community in this field. As you, most of you might know, the IMR community is quite small if you compare with other scientific uh, disciplines. So that is one of our major um, missions is to really mobilize and increase the knowledge on, on IMR. Uh, going to a bit more um, on the detail level, um, GPMR not only supports research in the therapeutics and diagnostic fields, so we also support research especially in the transmission area, in the environment. We have done a lot of uh, important contributions in the environment, especially on, on transmission and, and, and uh, surveillance and wastewater, uh, but also, as mentioned, in interventions and surveillance. So today I'm going to be talking a bit more on which type of project portfolio we have been supporting in the area of therapeutics that goes from discovery to a preclinical area in and also on the diagnostics area that we not only support in the diagnostics, but also um, detection, and uh, and we have a specific portfolio for uh, point of care. So I will go a bit more on detail about that. Uh, so before we get started in the portfolio, just to give an overview on how works our financial uh, instruments. So we have two major financial instruments, uh, one that is uh, support of research networks, and the other one is to support research projects. Regarding uh, research networks, we do um, punctual calls um, to really support the development of networks uh, in specific areas. And normally uh, what we support is one PI, one coordinator. We provide them a lump sum of about 50,000 to 200,000 euros, depending on the topic. And the aim of that is to create this network and to brainstorm new ideas and to develop uh, the outcome to develop white papers and guidelines and uh, this type of, uh, of really to support the policy uptake side. And on the other side, we have annual call for research projects uh, that are to aim to support um, uh, research consortia internationally. So what we support needs to be a large international consortia with at least uh, three uh, representative of institution of the countries that apply for the call. And um, what we find is really, as I mentioned, a broad spectrum from um, basic research to uh, to the preclinical stage. And it's a two-stage application process. And right now we have uh, one research call open. So I just want to mention uh, that is in the area of IMR interventions. So this is IMR interventions in the full One Health spectrum, including uh, fungi, not only bacteria. And we also have a specific subtopic on um, specifically uh, to fungi. So really, if any of you is interested, there will be a webinar, information webinar this Wednesday. So I welcome you to attend it if you are interested in applying to, to this opportunity. And then uh, moving to really uh, the GPMR portfolio. So how we have been uh, supporting the discovery pipeline in the last year. So our portfolio is focusing in new target identification uh, and also on all the full spectrum of novel therapies, as well as on a second stage, also the area of repurposing and drug optimization. If we go a bit more in details of about uh, this, uh, 40 projects that we are supporting at the moment, as you would, I would like to highlight the diversity of the portfolio. So we are looking specifically, as you can see, about the new type of leads and targets and molecules that we are supporting. So we have from direct acting small molecules, but also a lot on repurposing of, of new agents. And so it's, it's very important for us to, to have this uh, wide spectrum. I mean, we need to, to seek um, um, diversity in order 
to generate and, and, and to be able to fit the pipeline from the beginning uh, to the basic and discovery uh, part. So as you can see, so we have in this slide, we have uh, supporting direct active molecules, enablers and potentiators, antiviral agents, purposing, but also uh, alternatives, I will go more in details with type of alternatives like phage or nanobiotics that we are supporting. And just to highlight that we not only support a treatment at the human um, um, approach, but also we have two projects that focus on the veterinary side. Um, if we go a bit more in detail, as you can see, 33% of what we are supporting uh, is uh, non-traditional approaches. So we are also supporting uh, very much um, alternatives to uh, new antibiotics, and uh, we have not only phage therapies, that we have three, I think, projects in that area, but also if lux pumps or, you know, biofilms. So the mode of actions are also diverse in our portfolio. Um, another, so from this type of projects, what we can see, like, we, um, since we are funding this about since seven years, so the first outcomes of the first projects is what you can see in this slide. So we can start to see which type of new leads, indications, and, and patents that are being filed from this from this beginning of the projects, but that's always less than like a third of our portfolio. So at the end of this year, beginning of next year, we are going to see uh, more results from the major bulk of the projects that we are supporting. So this is just to say the very first hints of uh, actually what of the first projects that we funded has, um, has which type of successes, which kind of results, which type of outcomes, and it, it looks quite promising. As you can see, there's a diversity of new leads to be identified from biofilms, but also like peptides and, and um, inhibitors. So a lot of different uh, type of leads as well as therapeutic indications. And we are also happy to see that eight patents has already been filed. So this is important to us to see how uh, our major aim is to really help to shape and support projects that we will continue uh, uh, into the pipeline and that other funders be after us, like, like Carbex and Carpi can take over the successful projects and results from, from these projects and, and to continue to fund them into moving into the clinical stages. So we also have uh, some of the projects that has been uh, funded, uh, continue funding uh, by um, other colleagues from, from more uh, that support the, clini the clinical development um, stages. So this is promising and we are looking forward to see more results at the end of this year on of, of this um, first project. Uh, but also, as mentioned before, we have been also supporting networks, and the networks in the area of therapeutics has been producing very interesting papers. So we support, uh, for example, BIM Alliance and, um, and other networks really to look at the regulatory uh, space. So we are also looking about how to facilitate, um, you know, to move from, from preclinical to clinical, what are the needs, um, how we can work together on this. And uh, we also been supporting lately a specific network on antifungal resistance, which is really a new area, a small community, and we are hoping to, to support it to be able to grow and to create, uh, to help them to develop new solutions in, in this field. And then now moving to the diagnostic portfolio, where we have about uh, 30 projects. Here as well, we have a first batch that is really on new diagnostic tools, techniques and methods and detection methods. And then we also have other type of projects, like a large part of them really focus in diagnostics in low resource settings. So it's more about rapid diagnostics, point of care techniques, identifying these, these barriers for developing an uptake of this rapid diagnostic test. So it's, it's very important in the diagnostics field, we've been doing a special effort to engage and to be able to support researchers in low and middle income countries to work together in international consortia to understand better those needs, especially we have large projects in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia to really see uh, how we can move forward in the area of uh, point of care, combine many of them with um, in, in the area of surveillance. We also support in a lot of projects in, in how to move forward, harmonization, standardization of surveillance, one health approach surveillance, etc. Here's a bit of 
short snapshot of the type of projects that we are supporting in the area of diagnostics. As you can see here, also quite diverse regarding pathogen and indication. Um, so I don't know how to highlight, for example, uh, you know, biosensors, tools for clinical diagnosis of bloodstream infection, also artificial intelligence based methods for um, peripherostatic joint infection diagnosis, etc. So this in the area of diagnosis, we don't have so many results as the first um, the first round of grantees will finalize the projects this year. So we have not yet get concrete results that I can show you, but uh, we've been following them and, and there's also very promising uh, things that are that we are expecting um, as a result and outcomes of, of those projects. Just to finalize, this has been a quick outline of our portfolio, but also you can uh, check on our website. There's a database where you will have full details of all the projects, all the researchers involved, specificities. Also, you can have videos from those projects, um, paper, the papers published, the database of all the papers that are published uh, from all the projects. So you have a lot of information on all of them so i encourage you to to go to the website and check the database and the dashboards with with the description of all the projects in my last slides just to, to a bit of, to hint a bit about the future so this year 2024 this call that we have right now open on, on interventions will be the last call that we will publish under gpmr as GPMR is right now transitioning evolution into a new organization that is going to be called one health IMR partnership, OHIMR, and uh, which will get started in 2025. This transition means that uh, we are uh, going to be working together, not the member states, with the European Commission to mobilize even more funding for uh, One Health IMR research. So in this new uh, partnership, we'll be um, able to, to increase the budget, mobilizing also budgets from the European Commission, and since in the last seven years, we have been mobilizing about 170 million euros. We expect it to um, be able to mobilize in the next seven years uh, over 300 million euros. This will be able to, to engage with more countries, mobilize more funders, uh, get a more uh, global approach, and, and really to be able to, to, to contribute to the pipeline and to the full IMR challenge. So I'm looking forward. Uh, this expansion of uh, GPMR and moving forward, the OHIMR. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Um, fantastic uh, uh, overview of all the, the great um, initiatives and activities of, of uh, GPR EMR. I think we're all impressed with a very broad portfolio because you basically cover um discovery right from discovery to to intervention so that is um that is very impressive um also great to hear that you collaborate with uh, with carbix uh, so that's nice um and that is actually a perfect introduction um to the next speak and i will come back to uh, to you laura later with some questions uh, but uh, suggest we move on thanks again laura uh, but that is indeed a great introduction to the next uh, speaker who will talk about another great organization, uh, Carbix, which is a, a global uh, uh, biopharmaceutical accelerator focusing more on discovery and early development. Um, and and, and uh, uh, Carbix will be presented by the Chief of Research and Development, Erin Duffy. And it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Erin. She, um, as you can see in the slide, she, she used to work at Melinta and also work at Pfizer um and um uh, because of her activities particularly at melinda as the chief scientific officer and research development she is obviously the perfect person to lead research and development at carbic so uh, erin you have the, you have the floor and thanks for joining thank you very much for the kind introduction and i'm really happy to be here and i'm extremely happy to have followed laura because it really does hopefully lay out for everyone um, you know, how we collaborate and work together in this space. I'm told if I'm patient, this will work out. Ah, okay. 
Uh, I was not patient enough. Hello. Okay, so um, just a, a highlight of CARBEX. Um, you know, as Herman said, we are a global partnership uh, accelerating early stage antibacterial R&D. Um, I'll show you that we do where we sit uh, in that ecosystem. Our funders are as shown, so the U.S. government through uh, BARDA and the National Institutes of Health, uh, the Wellcome Trust, the German government, the U.K. government, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and more recently, the Canadian government, and we just announced last week funding from the Nova Nordisk Foundation. Uh, very humbled and grateful for their support. Uh, quite like JPI AMR, we do focus on three pillars uh, in this area. So therapeutics, and that's both traditional and non-traditional therapeutics, prevention inclusive of, but not exclusive of vaccines, and finally rapid diagnostics. And the model for our diagnostics portfolio is one that we call aligned by design. And the purpose there is to really focus the development certainly on technology uh, that advances the fields, but very much tied to what will be needed for a therapeutics and prevention portfolio, uh, not only for the conduct of clinical trials, but then also for uptake of therapeutics and preventatives from the portfolio. Our model is completely non-dilutive. Our uh, product developers do as assume a, a small cost share. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later, we are not just funding, but in fact, a very comprehensive support model. And that's in fact, in part, owing to uh, the types of organizations that are toiling away in this space. All programs must enter through an active funding call and, and I'll share some uh, a slide coming up with what those have been. Uh, not only do we focus on the priority pathogens that are listed both uh, by the WHO and the CDC, but increasingly, we focus more on syndromes and importantly, the performance characteristics that are necessary for patients. Our efforts uh, certainly have placed our products aiming at uh, those uh, indications with the highest morbidity and mortality on which certainly was shown a strong light by the 2022 report in The Lancet. Um, you know, we certainly are proud of the portfolio that we have curated and accelerated to date, and, and we feel there's been significant progress and a lot more work to do. So in a snapshot below, just to say that we have funded about, four, or, sorry, we have evaluated about 1,400 expressions of interest, and that's the first step uh, in, in the CARBEX application process. Uh, today, we have signed 97 individual product developer agreements. And you've seen a few if you follow our website, uh, very recent press releases on new programs that have come in the portfolio. Today, as a result of that, we have 32 active projects across the portfolio. In terms of some of the progress, you can see the numbers here. We have advanced into uh, and through uh, first in human studies, certainly for the treatment and prevention portfolio, 14 individual projects. In diagnostics, we have ushered five through validation and verification. Today, of those therapeutics and preventatives, there are four that remain active in advanced clinical development. And in the diagnostics world, we have two products that have reached the market in Europe. So just to place us uh, in the ecosystem, we've heard from Lara, and so Lara's group is to the left of us, uh, really spanning uh, or bridging basic research into early translational research. And there's a lot of activity there, both funded by governments and other organizations uh, that, that we uh, very much rely on uh, for good substrate and innovation coming into the CARBEX portfolio. Our focus is exclusively uh, in therapeutics and prevention from the hit to lead stage uh, through to a demonstration of safety in humans and whether that's healthies uh, or patients is very much dependent on the product characteristics and target product profiles. In diagnostics, we fund from the feasibility stage through to demonstration uh, of an alpha development prototype and validation thereof. We sit upstream, uh, or, or I guess downstream, um, from the advanced development groups uh, such as GARP-P, and, and you'll hear from Peter uh, very shortly, the AMR Action Fund, uh, BARDA, and others. 
I've said this, but just to shine a light on it, again, we do fund uh, Hit to Lead and Therapeutics through to First in Human and Prevention, a similar time frame, so antigen or composition discovery through to First in Human, and then finally feasibility through alpha uh, prototype development and diagnostics. I'm not gonna read this slide to you, it's a lot of words, but just to say, and, and, and you've certainly been hearing this as well, um, a lot of what we wish for in products is absent in today's clinical pipeline. Um, and so we really need the substrate coming from, um, you know, uh, uh, groups such as JPI, AMR into CARBEX where we can help them uh, and prepare them for advanced development so that we can push them closer to patients. And again, I won't read this to you, but several groups have called out in the, in the public and private or in the public and scientific uh, literature the funding gap uh, that exists. And you know, if you think about it, there are you know, there's not just one infection, there's not just one patient type, there's not just one approach. Uh, and so we do need several projects and several approaches, and that takes a substantial amount of money. Uh, if you take the integral over uh, the different um, suggestions here, we're looking at something around about 170 to 500 million dollars annually to deliver a pipeline of high impact products in this space. I've said it, but uh, to come into the Carbex portfolio, everything comes through active funding calls. Uh, in the first four years of the Carbex existence, we had eight individual funding calls. They started, uh, as we would call them, all comer trials. So very general, if you have something in the area of AMR, we wanna hear from you. Uh, in 2019 was our first foray into thematic uh, calls where we had calls for non-traditional specifically, calls for vaccines and biotherapeutics, calls for diagnostics, and then a call laser focused on small molecule antibiotics for gram negative infections. Last year in October, or actually in 2022 in October, we launched an omnibus solicitation, which continued on that theme of focused funding. Uh, we had three funding themes. One was focused on oral therapeutics with several product uh, profiles. One was focused exclusively on vaccines, uh, focused on the top etiologies for neonatal sepsis, and then finally a cross-pillar call solved treatment, prevention, and diagnostics for gonorrhea. Uh, in that omnibus, not only were there three funding themes, but three intake opportunities, and we published this on our website to give product developers opportunities to build the right data package and then apply it in an appropriate time. We intend to launch uh, new rounds this year, and the themes will be shaped by the recent strategic review that we conducted in the fourth quarter of 23. The application stages, just to say there are a few. Uh, expression of interest is the first, and, and that is a completely non-confidential, just let us know what you have, uh, and that is juried solely for responsiveness to the call. There is then a, a fulsome confidential written proposal that is juried by external experts that represent the breadth and depth of disciplines necessary to evaluate the application. Select projects from that are then brought to a virtual advisory board where the focus is really on answering remaining questions uh, that the advisory board had. Uh, and then successful application recommendations are brought forward to the CARBEX uh, investment committee for final approval. Uh, this is small, I'm sorry to say, but on the left is uh, from the first eight funding calls and on the right is from the omnibus solicitation. And you can see uh, from expression of interest through to projects uh, that are approved for funding, it's about an eight to 10% uh, success rate overall. I wanna emphasize our support model. I said it uh, before, all of our funders can give out money better than Carbex can any day of the week, and that is not why they've entrusted us with their funding. Uh, but a lot of these product developers, and you saw this on an earlier slide, are in fact very small organizations, sometimes five to 10 FTEs. They're typically expert at the foundational technology, but may not have the breadth and depth of all of the drug discovery and early development expertise necessary to bring products forward. And so our model is a layered model. It begins with our internal R&D team, um, who are really the sort of internal champions of the program. 
uh, together with the product developer, the R&D lead then builds a company support team that provides virtual hands um, and, and, and brains uh, from a very large and diverse SME pool of about now 150 or so subject matter experts. Another thing that we've instituted about a year or two ago is a standing clinical advisory. And this group is meant to engage about a year or so before product developers are ready um, to file a dossier to the regulatory authorities to begin first in human studies. And this just helps them think of a, you know, perform a sort of Merlin exercise. What do you want your label to be? And now let's work back to what an appropriate toxicology package and first in human package should look like. We have a whole initiative around portfolio acceleration tools, and, and I'll get to that on a, a subsequent slide. But basically, these are units of work that we uh, at Carbex execute uh, with external partners to help answer questions that more than one product developer is facing. And so this is meant to be efficient and not only to help our portfolio, but through publication and presentation uh, and availability of tools, the ecosystem as well. NIAD has been excellent in offering preclinical services to our portfolio, and recently they've expanded those to include diagnostic offerings. More recently, we've commenced a pilot around market shaping, and I look forward to seeing how that is going to evolve. And then finally, as we are not the final stop uh, of these products uh, until they make it to the market, we are instituting a business development council, and we started with an investor day last year that we will have again this year at ECMIT. And the idea is to help these companies find downstream partners and funding for advanced development. Uh, our portfolio uh, is very focused on the areas of high uh, morbidity and mortality as outlined in the Lancet uh, paper. So this is a stylized version of, I think, table three uh, in that paper. And you can see the red dots just indicate programs in our portfolio and the yellow are those uh, that have been signed from the omnibus. And again, I think you can see we're very focused where the need really is. I mentioned the portfolio acceleration tools. I don't have time to talk about all of these, but to say uh, they do come in various flavors from susceptibility studies with contemporary panels and a large contemporary uh, panel of control antibiotics, all the way through to improvement of animal models of infection and a very unique collaboration. And then through all the way to the right um, to clinical trial design and influence of regulatory um, guidance. This is a snapshot of the programs that we have advanced closer to patients. Where they start is where Carbex funding began. Uh, and so the blue represent our therapeutics uh, portfolio, the yellow prevention and the red uh, diagnostics. And this is just to show you uh, the several types of projects uh, that have entered MAN and have advanced beyond. Many of our uh, graduates uh, remain active with follow-on funding. And you can see here uh, from Claramedics, which is conducting a first in human presently in a phase 1B, uh, all the way through to T2 Biosystems, which was one of our first products on the market uh, in Europe. These programs have been supported by a number of external partners. And that's really our job, is to help them advance the, the uh, products in a way that are um, you know, most um, attractive uh, to bring to patients so that it is easy for advanced development partners to take them up. We've also co-funded, so the Nova Repair uh, Fund has funded many of the programs that we have. So this is a snapshot from their website, and you can see the check marks indicate uh, the programs that we have co-funded. And likewise, a snapshot from the AMR Action Fund website uh, where we were very happy to see several of our program and former product developers uh, enter that portfolio. I know I'm running short of time, but I do want to say this is very important. Um, as much as we are about innovation and innovative products, we recognize our role and responsibility in access and stewardship. And this isn't just nice words. In fact, together with a number of organizations, including um, Guard P and others, uh, we developed the first practical guidance for uh, how to develop stewardship and access plans. This is not optional for our product developers. Everyone must sign this contractually, 
uh, and we do follow the programs as they advance and mature. Finally, to say uh, we are very proud of a lean and efficient uh, in, uh, organization that we've built. Um, again, leveraging uh, external experts. I talked about that. Um, we have performance-based uh, milestones and gating the projects so that we really encourage uh, laser focus on uh, quality and um, expeditious product development. Because we are domiciled at Boston University, we do leverage the infrastructure here and we are very grateful for that support. Uh, and then finally, very much um, keep our eyes on where the money goes. And to that point, should say, and we are very proud of this, that 95% of all of our funding goes either directly to product developers uh, or through the support model that I uh, defined with only 5% of the funding going to Boston University and CARBEX management. I will end with this, uh, rather than a picture of all of the CARBEX faces, as attractive and happy as we all are, I think it's important to show uh, the number of projects uh, that we have been very happy and proud to support. And with that, I thank you and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Erin, uh, for a great presentation. Um, and to summarize all the fantastic activities on CARBEX, um, um, it is indeed a, a unique uh, funding model, and, and I would I would agree with you that the funding early stage research is, is absolutely indispensable and it's urgent. And it's fantastic that you are particularly um, funding uh, these kind of research activities. And I have to say, I'm also impressed that that only five percent of the budget is spent on management. That is a great achievement, and indeed you should be you should be very proud of that because we often waste a lot of money in those kind of uh, uh, management activity. So it's good that the money really is used for research. So uh, great, uh, great achievement. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Again. Thank you. All right. So we'll come back to you during the discussion. Uh, but, uh, but first of all, before we start our discussion, I would like to welcome and introduce uh, Peter Bayer um, because he will talk uh, uh, about the, the third great non-commercial organization addressing the problem of antimicrobial resistance. Peter is currently the Deputy Executive Director at uh, GARTP, but those of you who might be familiar with the EMR activities at WHO might remember him from his WHO activities because he led the unit that was responsible for developing global initiatives to foster development and access to new antimicrobial treatments. And that's also where I used to know Peter very well, and I was always impressed with the work he was doing there. But now he's joined uh, GARTP, and I think GARTP is probably very pleased with that. So, Peter, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Herman. Um, thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to present a little bit about GARDP. It's always uh, fantastic to speak after Laura and, and Darren and to show that we are actually working hand in hand in this um, you know, development of new antimicrobials. We, it's, it's for me also very interesting always to see that JPI AMR, which Laura is running, is, is much earlier than we are and much broader. Uh, you're looking at the environmental issues around AMR into infection prevention and control, which is super important. And then you can see this on this slide, then it's, it's followed up by CARBIC. So ideally, you know, JPI AMR project, as you saw, one of them already graduated into CARBIX funding and, and CARBIX also broader than we are, covering diagnostics, vaccines and therapeutics. Um, and then it, it is, uh, um, and, and we are ideally picking up the projects that come out of CARBIX um, and, and uh, after the preclinical and, and first in human trials, as Aaron said, and that is where our main role is. Um, and I'm happy to present you a couple of the things we did in the past. But before it's, um, I wanted to say a few words about the way how we are working, because you saw from JPI, AMR and CARBIX that one of the main tools that apply is these call for proposals, uh, call for research projects, call for research networks, as Laura phrased it. Um, and which is typical, which is a really good instrument to, to attract the best possible projects and to see also what is happening globally. 
Um, that is something that we are not doing because we are mostly focusing on phase two, phase three, meaning that um, with the WHO pipeline review in particular, we do know actually which projects are in phase two, phase three. These are companies that are out. There's um, normally there's a, you know some data, some science is published, so you can actually look at the pipeline, which is unfortunately um, very small. So there are only um, there are not so many projects that you need to assess, and these are actually projects that we are following over the lifespan span. So even when they are in the CARBX portfolio, we already look at it whether these are projects that we may actually want to pick up to include in our portfolio, whether they fit our um, you know our main vision and mission, um, and also whether the science is really is really um, uh, uh, convincing. And that is why we are we are actually looking at screening projects, um, talking to the companies, uh, talking to the people who work on the projects, to then um, enter into negotiations with the with the companies, and then eventually sign collaboration agreements. Um, and that is what I'm going to talk about as well. So. Um, and, and one of the reasons also why we don't do calls is that we are not a mere funder. So it's not that um, that when we select a, a project on which we want to work, a company with whom we want to work on developing a new antibi antibacterial treatment, it's not that we would actually um, sign a funding agreement and fund the activities of a company. Um, it is much more that we are going to, act, to jointly collaborate on the drug development. And they are, and that we do in many instances. And, and one very important um, collaboration is, for example, on the chemical um, and chemical and manufacturing, where we're looking at the development of the formulation, um, how it, in the end, it's going to be manufactured, um, and 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 that is something where we really can bring technical expertise to our. Partners and as Aaron said, many of these companies are very small and they do not have in-house capacity to do this. Um, why is this important? Because um, our, one of our focuses is on um, needs in low and middle-income countries. So it really matters what the cost of goods um, are when the product comes to the market, whether it's going to cost one dollar to manufacture, ten dollars, or fifty dollars because it has a huge impact on access. And we eventually, if we, if you really want to serve the patients who need these drugs most, um, it really matters whether they will cost $1 or, or $50 to produce. And that is why this um, technical assistance, this collaboration on formulation development is so important. We also, in certain collaborations, we are um, we are be, we are the sponsor of the clinical trials, and and we have sponsored one huge phase three trial for zoliflodesin. Um, and in other collaborations, it may be the company sponsoring the trial, and we contribute to the trial design. Uh, so um, that is illustrated on this slide, which shows that that we are doing much more than actually funding research projects but it's really something that um, we are also doing in-house. How we do this um, with the companies, um, it is of course more complicated and, it of, and, and if you do a collaboration in phase three towards registration and then towards um, delivering the products to the patients, uh, you, you, it, is, it is a more complex environment. So ideally, in our collaborations, we enter into a collaboration and license agreement where we um, agree with the company not only on who is going to, to pay for the research, who is going to carry out the research, um, but also on who is responsible for which territories, meaning um, which countries will be in the portfolio of the originator company and which companies are actually going to be served by GARP-P so typically sub-licensees who um, are going to do the manufacturing and distribution of the product. And, uh, and that is something where our experience is the earlier you are entering into the negotiations on these collaboration agreements, the 
more interesting and the more comprehensive the agreements are and the better you can serve actually um, um, the patients and uh, and that is something that we have experienced over um, the past five years when we started to do these kind of agreements. We are doing this of course not our own but in partnership. I mentioned already of our most important partners are the companies. Without them we would not be able to do this and this includes both um, R&D companies like Shionogi with whom we work on Cafeteracol. Um, it, uh, it includes IST and Tasis with whom we work on Zoliflodacin but it also includes um, generic manufacturers in, for, our, for our trial. Um, with uh, with generic drugs for neonatal sepsis, so we are working across the whole spectrum of of pharmaceutical industry. But we also work, of course, with all the people and the all the, the, who are doing the clinical trials in the countries. And uh, this is really a, a essential for us to do the clinical trials in the countries where the disease burden is the highest. So for zoliflodacin. We um, did. We recruited a huge part of the patients in Thailand and in South Africa, as well as in the Netherlands, Belgium, and the US. We have promised um, five treatments by 25 um, in our second business plan, and uh, and this is where we are. We are very proud to be able to, to report back actually that uh, for Cafe Deracol, we have not only signed the license agreement with Shionogi who developed the drug, but we, we have an um, agreement with the manufacturer Orchid in India who is now getting the technology to produce this, um, this new antibiotic uh, in, in India. And we do hope that uh, this technology transfer is going to be successful and that uh, ORCID is going to register the drug, the drug in the coming years. This is not a trivial, trivial process. It is really, it is a very um, sophisticated manufacturing process. So um, it is also important to highlight that, that the manufacturing of some of these antibiotics is not as straightforward as many people would wish um, it to be and uh, um, so this is an interesting test case on whether this um, is going to work and also whether our manufacturers and sub licensees can set up a viable business for cafeteracol for the distribution in our territory which includes 135 countries the um, second of the um, projects we have to, to address serious bacterial infections and sepsis is Kepepim Tanipobactam, which uh, we developed together with Venatorix. We are very proud that uh, Venatorix has filed for FDA approval in the US um, and we have an agreement with, um, with Venatorix that we are going to develop the pediatric formulation and are going to be the sponsor of the trials for the um, pediatric population which is of course very important because many of these new antibiotics are actually never uh, clinically tested in children. We also envisage um, another research collaboration in the area of serious bacterial infections and sepsis. You, you may have heard that we have signed a term sheet with Bugworks um, a company in India who is uh, who is working on a very promising um, compound um, which is addressing Arsenitobacter and, and other priority pathogens. This is um, currently funded by Carbix, so I think it's a good example that if we are going to pick up this, uh, this new collaboration that um, companies can actually graduate out of Carbix agreement and then um, be included into the Guard P portfolio. On neonatal sepsis, we have um, started in South Africa uh, um, a very sophisticated trial where we are we are testing three three combinations of um, existing generic treatments to find one or two new treatment regimens for neonatal sepsis because um, we have uh, we have in our observationist trial 
um, realize that in many countries the current uh, the current combination that is recommended by WHO is actually not working anymore because of the rampant um, uh, resistance. And then last but not least, on sexual transmitted infections, we have developed zoiflodesin um, together with entasis. We have uh, um, successfully finalized the phase three trial with nearly a thousand patients in five countries. Um, and uh, now uh, IST and TASIS, they are moving towards regulatory approval in the US. So we are um, on track to actually um, deliver against the promise five treatments by 25. This is the, um, the, the same portfolio um, presented a little bit different. You can see where we are starting from. Normally, priority diseases and infections our main focus are serious bacteria infections and sepsis, as well as STIs. And then you can see that we are focusing on the WHO priority pathogens, um, and then the treatments that are, do address actually um, the priority pathogens and the priority diseases and infections, um, as well as the key populations. Um, you can see here that uh, we um, looking for, for treatment to include for um, Arsenitobacter bomani and carbapenem, carbapenem resistant organisms. That is where we actually currently are discussing this bug works, as I mentioned. We are also looking at a new treatment for ESBL, um, an optimized treatment regimen. That is something that we are going to, um, to further assess over the next months and years to see what could be um, a possible optimized treatment regimen. Um, so these are the two open slots actually in, in the serious bacterial infections for adults. For neonatal sepsis, um, we also, um, in addition to the empiric treatment regimens that we are testing now in South Africa and then later in other countries, we're also going to see whether we should um, we should look into other antibiotics and, and, and see whether they could be useful treatment alternatives for neonatal sepsis. And then in sectional transmitted infections, we are going to see how zoliflodesin um, performs in, in real life, because hope, as I said, it is going to be filed for FDA approval. And then we want to quickly follow up with approvals in particular in South Africa and Thailand where we have um, where we have done the trial, and of course in Cambodia, one of these countries where you can see now, according to the WHO data, a high level of resistance to ceftriaxone and azithromycin already, or to cefixime. But here also we are going to explore other different um, new interventions. Um, it may be another treatment option, but you have seen also that um, that. Uh, Carvix is funding gonorrhea vaccines. So we are really open-minded. There's also the question about accompanying diagnostics. So that is where um, another of our research efforts is going to focus on in the coming years. This is the summary of what I just said. This is the current portfolio on the left hand. Um, continue developing up to five treatments and working with our current partners. Um, facilitate initial access for at least three treatments, those that make it to the market first, in particular zoliflodesin, but also cafederocol, when ORCID is actually registering um, the generic cafederocol. And then um, we are going to expand the portfolio, try to begin developing at least one additional new treatment um, and launch other critical partnerships for, to improve the, the ecosystem. You can see that what that that if you look at the impressive number of projects that are financed by JPI, AMR, and then Carbix, that our portfolio is, if you look at the numbers, the sheer numbers, is much more limited. And that is of course normal because drug development is this funnel where you where you have to start with a thousand um, a thousand ideas, and then you 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 in the funnel it actually is reduced to those that in the end make it to the market. But I think we also have to, and there's one thing that also Aaron mentioned, that the current pipeline is not that good. 
So there are not so many projects that are actually really worth picking up and investing a lot of money. But on the other hand, there's also the limitation of financing. I think we could do so much more together with the AMI Action Fund, um, together with other funders, um, if there would be um, not an enormous amount of resources if, com if you compared, for example, what went into um, COVID-19. But a certain amount of, of uh, financial investment is necessary actually to move a couple of these treatments over the line, over the finishing line, and also ensure that they are manufactured at good quality and that ultimately they are also reaching patients globally and not only in the US and a couple of European countries. And with that, I'm handing back to you, Hermann. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, and again, fantastic presentation. Um, um, I was familiar with, with all three organizations, but I have to say I learned a lot uh, uh, today, so it was really great. And uh, yeah, particularly um, great to listen to, uh, um, again, fantastic achievements of, of Guard P. Um, a different way there are some differences between uh, Guard P uh, and Carbex uh, and, and uh, GPI EMR. And you mentioned indeed that, are, that you don't publish calls. Um, you can even sponsor clinical trials. It's again uh, uh, different. Uh, but what I, I like particularly about GARP that makes you really unique is your access program and particularly access uh, to antibiotics um, that are highly needed uh, in lower middle income countries. And I have to say, when I was asked to chair the scientific advisory uh, committee of GARP, I did not hesitate one second because I think it's a really fantastic organization greatly needed uh, and so thank you for all the all your efforts uh, particularly again for low and middle income countries so we have uh, we have uh, about 30 minutes uh, for discussion which is which is great and i would like to thank the speakers for sticking to the to the allocated uh, time slot so that means indeed that we, we we do have time for 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 discussion um and indeed uh, don't uh, hesitate to submit your questions um once again, you can you can submit these the questions to the questions window, and then I can read them, and 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 Shireen will summarize them for me and and, and send them, for, uh, uh, so that uh, the, so that we can have a good discussion. But uh, while I wait for uh, your questions, uh, let me maybe start uh, one question to each of you. Um, three great organizations. Um, um, you mentioned your successes and achievements. Can you give me one example of, of where you are most proud of or what you have done um, uh, over the last, let's say, five to ten years? And let me start with, with Laura. What, what are you most proud of what you've been able to do? And then I'll move on to Erin and to, and to Peter. Well, where to start, you know? I think mm. uh, people uh, cannot remember how was the landscape ten years ago. So I think uh, one of the greatest achievements was really to convince countries to start mobilizing. And I remember when we launched the first call was in 2014, so 2015. So this was an achievement by itself, you know. Until then, there was no international collaboration on IMR. And also, look, all the organizations has come, Carvex, Carpi, the Action Fund. So I think the success has been this global um, commitment and engagement in the funding area that from almost, I mean, if we look at the budgets globally, we have doubled, triple, many countries have doubled and triple the IMR investments. So this has been an achievement that we've been pushing at GPMR to coordinate the countries, bring people together, and also to be able to, with all the new players coming, that we are complementary each other in the pipeline. So that has been from the very beginning, this also not only funding from GPMR, but really trying to coordinate um, all, all the different funding initiatives and, and, the, and the different initiatives at the national level to be able to, to bring together. So I think this is it's an important important achievement. Yeah. And I'm going to that I need to remember at, at the time when I was chairing the Scientific Advisory Committee of, of, of GPIMR, that was indeed a big, a big uh, challenge. And, and I think you've, 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 you've succeeded wonderfully to uh, um, make sure that these uh, countries would work uh, more closely together, Laura. So yeah, I can only uh, echo what you were saying that I imagine that you're most proud of that, uh, uh, Laura. Yeah. Erin, what do you think is your biggest success of, 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 of Carbix? 
Um, well, yeah, it's hard to pick, but but I would say this, and and I'll go back to the support model. That I'll be honest, we've we've been building it as we're flying the plane. I guess is the way you say that. But um, you know, there's there's a balance of how much you support, and you know, how how long do you drag a program on, and and you know, but yet give it the right opportunity. And you know, Peter mentioned CMC a, a lot in in his talk, and. You know, that is an area often where you know, everything's going great, the microbiology looks good, the pharmacology looks good, even the toxicity looks good, and then that happens. And you know, you just don't have the wherewithal. And, and I can think of a few cases in our portfolio where you know, we could have said, well, you know, that's the end of the game, but instead um, really dug in and did that with some of our scientific advisors almost to become embedded um, you know, with the company's permission, again, the, the product developers are still the lead of our program. But, you know, go to the contract manufacturing organizations, understand the challenges, maybe bridge the communication, and in a couple of cases have made the difference between ending a program and really advancing it. Um, so, you know, we're very proud of that, you know, not saying we get it right all the time, but really trying to understand those needs and how and when to dig in to advance a project. Thank you, Erin. Not everybody might be familiar with 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 the, with the drug development. So, could you explain a little bit what CMC is? Oh yeah, sorry. It chemistry, manufacturing, and controls, and basically comes in a couple of flavors. You know, there's the simple. You know, you make it on milligram or even smaller than that. You know, enough to like fuel a little. Uh, you know, maybe high throughput screen through to I need grams of this to put in people. Um, and you know that scaling can often be very difficult. That's one example. Another example is um, you know, getting a salt form right. You know, depending on the complexion of the molecule, um, you know how it's best going to you know um, you know perform. Whether you need it to dissolve well or you know whatever the other options are. Um, and then you know also too, it's that you know the drug substance which is the molecule versus the drug product which is when it's all together you know does it pass spec do you have impurities can you qualify those impurities so all that stuff and you know large pharmaceutical companies have incredibly talented armies to get this stuff done we don't and so we have to call on them and then again help balance you know that effort Super great. Yeah, CMC is also a big issue for GARP, Peter. We had lots of discussions about that. Peter, what, what are you most proud of it with GARP? I mean, first of all, I'm very happy you asked uh, Aaron to explain what CMC is and not me. <laughs> I, did it very and well. I, learned, I learned from what Aaron said. I'm trying next time. I need to explain. I, I copy. <laughs> Um, but I totally agree. Our our partners, it's the same. Huh? It is so important. Um, but yours, what is the greatest achievement? I think, you know, as you said, I, I used to be um, with WHO and I remember when um, when DNDI came and Manika used to be with MSF when, when we developed this idea of, of setting up something like GARP and now it's up and running. Um, we have nearly 100 people, we have raised 200 million um, euros. So I think that as such, I think is a, is a real success and that that the three of us are here, Laura, Erin and, and me for God P and then also the AMI fund. There's a whole different ecosystem for anti anti antimicrobial R&D today in this non non-profit space than 10 years ago. Okay, super. Yeah, great. Thanks, uh, 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 and that's also why I greatly respect what you're doing at GARP, Peter. All right, so um, um, a few more questions. Um, uh, the fact that that the pipeline is not looking good was mentioned, for instance, by 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 um, Erin and also by by Peter. Um, you are mainly uh, funding, uh, uh, let's say, push uh, models. Um, Maybe first a question to to Laura and to Erin. Uh, are you indeed that 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 pessimistic? In other words, in what you are funding, are you seeing some hope that we might be hoping, hopefully, um, uh, seeing some new targets, new mechanisms of actions over the next 
five to ten years, or are you are you very pessimistic? And are you saying, well, no, there's nothing in the pipeline. There's no, I don't, we don't see any new class of antibiotics, new targets. We don't see any new mechanism of action. Or is that too pessimistic? For a question for all of you, maybe Erin, Laura, what, what what do you think? Is it indeed that bad as we as you were saying? I guess I'll start and say no. So. I mean, innovation is alive and well, and I, I want to say in, in part, you know, of those three funding themes that I mentioned from our omnibus solicitation, and let's be honest, these were very specific funding themes, an oral therapeutic, a vaccine for neonatal sepsis, you know, novel products for gonorrhea. We received, I think, about 237, it's a precise number, I know, uh, expressions of interest, you know, from, from many places largely very early programs, so it's there. The question is, how do you, you know, how do you draw it forward and support it appropriately so it gets into the hands of Peter or the AMR Action Fund? I think that's one thing. The other thing I, I feel I must say uh, is that innovation comes in all stripes, you know, so the novel classes and the novel targets that you mentioned, you know, we certainly encourage and focus on, but we also encourage you know, products that are, you know, enhanced versions of very successful products. Why? Because you can improve a dosing regimen or a safety. You know, think about, you know, the quinolones. Everybody loves them. If you had a better levofloxacin, you know, a safer levofloxacin, dynamite. And so the question is, how do you balance that? But people are doing innovation across all of these areas, and it's just our job to help them bring it forward. That sounds that sounds optimistic. Laura, do you do you share that optimism? Well, you know, I'm optimistic, but maybe not as enthusiastic as Erin. Uh, how will Mati a bit uh, filter it a bit? I mean, what we see really, what I think the good impact that we see is that if we compare what all the countries has been funded at national level in basic research, you know, we don't see so much outcomes of there. So, but we are very positive positive is like for example in the GPMR funding where we do more international level funding we can see that the outcomes are better you know they are more successful so when we are focusing more on on the priority pathogens by the WHO etc so we see more success level so this is the comparison we started to do last year what is being funded at national level what is funded at the international level so we are really seeing an improvement in that so we are really seeing that this push of the last years is starting to pay off i mean that's why we don't yet see the results because of course if we have started to do this push and this increase of funding in the last five six years of course we don't see yet those results but i mean i'm very confident and positive that we are going to get them very soon that in a year or two we are going to be in a much better space than now so from the discovery side so that is really our our hopes is in that direction that and as as erin said we really see a lot going on in the repurposing and combinations when we do the first course on that area no one was applying for example and i had to say that so we received very little applications and now this has changed you know, now when we do something on repurposing, it's increasing and we have a lot of applications. So the space is moving rapidly and we are going to see the results of the last year's efforts very soon. Yeah. Herman, may I just add one thing? Yeah, go Sorry. Ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the, mm -hmm. one, the other thing I wanted to say is, um, you know, if you were to look at the Carbex portfolio today for therapeutics, it is, um, it is, it is certainly more than 50% non-traditional products at this point. Uh, and in part, that's due to that 2019 call we had, and that's wonderful, okay? Mm -hmm. But part of when I say we need to help bring these things through, the regulatory paths for these are not clear. Most of them are going to have to be used adjunctive standard of care. What should the endpoints be? How do the regulators think about this? And so, you know, with all of this, we have an enormous responsibility um, to help confirm or refute and find the most expeditious path forward. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean that sounds rather optimistic. You know, you're saying that that let's say the push uh, in uh, incentives are paying off, and I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, so let me let me continue along those those lines. So so you know what you are funding is paying off. You see some interesting discovery programs. We may have some new targets, new antibiotic classes. All that is great, so, and then non-traditional uh, ways of treatment. Um, so 
So what is needed then to, to bring those to the market? And maybe I can ask Peter uh, uh, perhaps to start uh, um, um, or invite him to, 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 to start that discussion about, so, okay, we have successful discovery programs. We may have some new class of antibiotics. So what next? What is needed to make sure that they actually will get to the patient? Peter. Yeah, that is where we have seen a lot of um, failures in, in, the, in the past years, where all, uh, even those who made it actually through the regulatory approval then didn't actually manage to successfully co commercialize their products. Um, you, often, you often hear that this is market failure. I, I think we also need to be, to be cognizant that not all of the antibiotics that came to the market in the past, you know, five, ten years were great. You know, on some of them, I'm sure clinicians were right that they were not jumping on them because they probably were not so much better than they already had in their portfolio. The clinical need was not, was not so clear. So I think we need to really think about um, shaping the pipeline also that we really focus the public money on those products um, that really will make a, a, a difference for the patients and that the clinicians um, really are looking for. And that is something that you don't do at the early stage, Laura and Aaron, because that's where you do innovation. You want to fund a lot of things. You want to fund crazy stuff. You want to fund stuff that fails. You want but then when we look at phase three, you know, we only want to invest in those where you, where you see a clear patient population, where you can see the manufacturing costs are, are okay, you can see and you know that, that you know, clinicians are, are looking into this. And I think one of the products, Cafeterico, you can see um, a lot of these national pool mechanisms selected the product. Um, you can see that a lot of clinicians in Europe are using it, in particular with MedVec patients coming from Ukraine, you know, so it's a really important product also in, in that respect. So, um, so I'm, up, and, and that, as I said, in, in, in our territory, we do really hope that our manufacturer will be able to, um, to, to make, to, that this is a business case, because otherwise, why would that orchid, I mean, invest in the manufacturing and then and distribute it? This company needs to make some money out of it, as well as Shionogi. And only, and that is a bit on the razor edge, you know. I mean, it's, it's, um, is Shionogi, will Shionogi be able to recoup their investment into the R&D and, and make some, some profit? Um, I do hope so, and that is where also these national pool mechanisms in 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 the UK, but also elsewhere, um, where they can help. Yeah, thank you for that, Peter. Yeah, there's a lot of discussions now about the, the different pool mechanisms. Also, a lot of discussions in Europe about this. Um, the two proposals on the table. Um, um, any of you have a strong opinion on on on, on how what kind of pool mechanism? would work best what we should do to make sure that what you are funding uh, um, um, uh, eventually will get to the patient any any opinions about that erin or laura or pt you already talked about this i think a pull mechanism would be really good <laughs> <laughs> a pull mechanism yeah yeah but maybe hey, hope you know, people will agree with it. yeah mm -hmm. please go ahead please go ahead yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, we've seen, you know, certainly the UK pilot is out there. They're, you know, now refining their success criteria. And, and I, I think, again, you got to start somewhere. I, I you know, I, I think that approach, certainly in the US, you know, we um, continue to be hopeful about past year. Um, but, you know, I, I think inactivity is worse than um, maybe not having the right model at the first. Actually, talking about funding, um, um, uh, Irene, um, why have you actually shifted to thematic funding calls uh, mm. rather than general general funding uh, funding calls? Why did you make that shift? Yeah, it's a good question. And so, what when we had the omnibus calls, they were framed by a series of strategic review discussions we had during the pandemic, and then a review of both the clinical pipeline. And you know the Lancet paper, which was timed, you know, nearly right before that, and then where the holes were in our own portfolio. And so, you know, taking those together, 
you know, that's where, you know, we shone a light. I mean, just to say today, there are only two products with oral potential in all of our portfolio for therapeutics, and we know we need good oral drugs. So that was kind of a no-brainer. Um, you know, I, I think we'll see where we go this year, whether, you know, they'll continue on a thematic um, tack or whether they'll be a little broader, not entirely sure. Um, but, but that was really why we, we remained largely open to approaches and modalities, but with specific lens on target product profiles. Okay, I see, I see. Okay, okay. And, and again, maybe a related question to, to Laura. I looked at your, at your um, uh, portfolio. Um, you spent around 9% on diagnostics, but, but more than double than that on surveillance. Uh, a bit, a bit less than interventions. Do you expect any any shift of funding of JPR EMR also, but maybe in the future in the partnership? Do, do you expect any 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 changes there? Any shift there? Yes, thank you for for this question. Because in what we have been doing the last funding has been, uh, um, you know, to complement uh, diagnosis with surveillance. And we have seen that majority of applications are going coming more from the surveillance side rather than from the diagnostic side, you know. So there has been also in the dynamics of the type of applications that we have received that it has gone in this direction. But yes, we are going to have a change um, for the future for HIMR, which is now under discussion of, of the funders. You know, we, we are going to have three different focal areas and then um, so diagnosis would be uh, more in the area of prevention um, and then we will have two types of diagnosis as in the prevention area and also together with the treatment area so we're going to change a bit on how uh, we've been approaching diagnostics uh, for the future in in a different type of modes to see i mean as we have been seeing that there has been large funding mechanism for diagnosis in the us and the uk for example in the last years so we also try to see um, how this goes and um, as in the current portfolio has been driven a lot from our members uh, that come from L LMACs to get a more approach on that. For example, South Africa has been very vocal to that we should be in, in how we should approach our, our portfolio in this area. So there's definitely going to be changes coming up for from next year onwards. Okay. okay. And then also a question about funding uh, of uh, Guard P. So, so Peter, um, um, you're not doing R&D yourself, right? Uh, or, or are you an R&D funded? Just can, can you clarify again what, is, what, what, what exactly you are funding and how are you doing that? Um, as I said, we, we normally enter into collaboration agreements with our pharmaceutical partners and then we are looking at who is best positioned to do which part of the, of the, in the drug development process. And um, we spoke about CMC, that is something where we have a CMC team which we are sharing with DNDI, so we can really bring like CARVIX um, uh, um, people from, from our team who actually are working together hand in hand with the company. Um, and then if it comes to the clinical trial, it can have different forms. So with Venatorix, Venatorix carried out the phase three for for CAFTAN and we contributed to the cost. So we um, we actually financed part of their phase three trial. Then the pediatric trials, we are going to be the sponsor and we are also going to pay for them. Um, and in the collaboration on Zoliflodacin, we, um, we financed the, uh, I mean, we financed and carried out as a sponsor the phase three trial and also were active in, you know, in the drug formulation process and are also helping our IST to prepare the regulatory dossier, which ultimately they are going to file. So this is something that we would normally not do. So, so what is then the difference with the traditional pharma model? Yeah, I think, the, well, the, first of all, we are looking at the products from a public health perspective. So we are selecting those where we think that it, it's going to make, you know, the biggest difference in terms of public health not where we think the, um, that, you know, it may be economically most attractive for a company. Uh, so we would also invest in, in projects where we don't actually see that they, you know, will make sense economically from a company perspective, which is why we invest in public money. Because uh, GARDP was set up and, and when, when we did this and we developed the concept um, we had colleagues from GSK, MSD, um, you know, Novartis, we spoke with them and the idea was always that 
yes, let us set up GAP as a product development partnership to do things that the pharma industry wouldn't do because they are actually commercially not attractive. And then the other aspect is also we, we, we carry out clinical trials differently. We actually look at really um, who is going to benefit from the product for zoliflodesin, gonorrhea, which is really affecting women. We really made an effort to actually enroll women in the trial. We want to do follow-up studies in, in breastfeeding and in, in, in pregnant women. Um, we also enrolled people, I mean patients who are co-infected with HIV because we do know that this population is actually particularly um, often, I mean, vulnerable to gonorrhea infections. So we really look at it much more from a public health perspective than versus, you know, what is the, you know, from a commercial perspective, what is the most secure um, trial we can actually do. Okay, okay, thanks uh, for clarif clarifying that, uh, Peter. So I think we, we, we're coming to an end. I, I see many more questions uh, and, and unfortunately we, we have to end our webinar. Maybe in the future we should, uh, we should consider another ex, uh, extra 30 minutes for discussion, but, uh, but because indeed we have many more questions. And, and thank you uh, all the participants for sending these questions. But, but again, we, we have to close our webinar. Um, I'd like to thank again the three speakers and, and again, showing my great respect for, for what, what they're all doing. It, um, this is badly needed. We need, really need uh, these organizations to develop new uh, uh, antibiotics, to bring them to the patients. Um, and so great respect for what you're doing. Please continue to work hard uh, on, on all, all, the, um, uh, all your initiatives. Um, and so with that, I would like to hand over to Shireen, uh, who may have some closing remarks. Thank you, of course, also to the uh, to the audience for the active participation and also for sending many questions. So have a nice uh, rest of the day or, or evening. Thank you. And thank you so much to you as well, Herman, for moderating today's uh, session. It was uh, really good, very engaging. Thank you to the audience for your questions. Um, I collect all of them and I will try to also see if we can answer some of them offline afterwards. Thank you once again also, Peter, Laura, Erin, for participating on today's webinar and for your very comprehensive presentations and very engaging discussion as well afterwards. So I just wanted to also um, quickly share about two of our upcoming webinars that we have later in February. So don't hesitate to go on our website to check them out and register. Here is the second one. And also we have the antimicrobial chemotherapy conference that's organized with GARD-P together with BSAC that's happening on the 6th and 7th of February. So this is an online and free conference to attend. And below you can see the website. So feel free to register to that. Also, don't hesitate to check the latest Revive updates on our website and to sign up to our newsletter and also follow our activities on Twitter and LinkedIn. So that's all for me. Thank you so much, everyone, once again, for your dis contributing to the discussion. I hope that everyone found the webinar interesting and that uh, you will join us in the future and also share with some of your colleagues. So thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.